Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. I'm seeing some gloomy faces this morning. Aren't you happy today? Amen. When you look at the news, there are a lot of people who cannot make it to reach 2019. And like a little boy, this 11-year-old boy in Florida yesterday accidentally shoot his friend, a 14-year-old boy. And imagine if you are their parents. It's not going to be a good new year for them. And we are supposed to be happy and grateful for what God has done for us today. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm so grateful that I can stand before you this morning. Um, I'm so undeserving thinking of myself. I see Paul Turner, <laughs> one of her um, future um, pastor, <clears throat> is with us, and I'm so glad to see him. And I felt that he could have spoke to us today, but uh, <clears throat> yes, yes. And I was told to stand before you this morning uh, three days ago, and supposed to be eldersly uh, to speak here on, on and I'm st st standing here on, on his behalf. And I tell you, when somebody show you trust, what do you feel? You're happy, right? It gave you joy. But at the same time, you see the responsibility that builds up that you need to fulfill. When God gave us responsibility, when God entrusted us, can we fulfill His desire? A lot of time it is impossible, right? By our strength. But with God, everything is possible. Amen. The topic that I chose to speak this morning is entitled, as you can see in your bulletin, Follow Through follow through. If you have Bible, or if you can find Bible in the pew, I want to start my speech, my sermon, by reading some verses of the Bible. My first reading is taken from the book of Mark. If you see Mark chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. And also, I'm going to read James chapter 1, uh, verse 21 through 25. If you see those verses, please say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to read from King James Version. Mark 4, 1 through, 5, 1 through 9. And again, he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables, and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Turn also James chapter 1, reading from verse 21 through 25. Therefore, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word 
which is able to save your souls. Be doer of the word, and not hearer only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he, was, but he looked it into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer, but the doer of the work. This one will be blessed and in what, and in what he does. This one will be blessed in what he does. May God bless the reading of his word. Do you know the chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus? I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's sing a cappella, just one verse. Just one verse. If you can follow me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Let us pray. Precious God in heaven, we have decided to follow you. Help, help us to follow through. Help us as we speak your word today. Please use me in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Before coming to Louisville, just two years before we come here, I was diagnosed of having the, uh, diabetes, and it was not easy to accept it. I tried to fight that disease by my exercise and my diet, and I see it's working. And because of that, without just being, working out or running, I try to find some sports that I enjoy. And I used to work, uh, I used to play badminton since I was young, started looking for a place to play badminton in Bristol, Tennessee. It was not easy to find. And I have to drive maybe one and a half hour to Asheville to drive, uh, to, to, to play badminton. And it is not possible to drive often to play badminton. And just before we came here, about a month before we reached Louisville, we even formed a club, badminton club, which is composed of Johnson City, Kingsport, and Bristol. So I was one of the person who formed that club and is still running at this time. Coming to Louisville, I immediately fall in love with the same game that I found. They played in E.P. Thompson Park. And, but I didn't find it enough. I want to play more because I want to make more exercise for my health. And sometimes I drive as far as Cincinnati to play badminton. It's crazy, isn't it? I know. <laughs> but I try to find some alternative instead of just looking on playing badminton. So I picked up tennis coming to Louisville. And we live very close to E.P. Thompson Park. They have about 12 courts outdoors. And I pick up the racket and I started off with my wife. <laughs> and it's so interesting that there are a lot of ways to improve in tennis and a lot of players, different types of styles that you can find. I was looking at you guys and I see that some of you are playing tennis as well in your life. Who have played tennis before? Oh yes, oh yes. So you guys will be knowing what I'm talking about today, which is good. I was practicing how to hit right tennis in one of the clubs here in Louisville. And in order to better my game, I took a video of myself 
and revise my video and see which part I have to improve. And one day, while I was taking the video, one of the club director saw me and said, come, come to my office. And I went there, and he looked at my video and giving me some advice on my technique and my strokes. And um, some of the things that he mentioned to me was very relevant to my spiritual life. And I brought one of my rackets here for us to demonstrate to you. <clears throat> one of the things that he said was, your grip was quite fine. You're holding semi-Western grips, and your preparation before the ball comes, how you put your, how you prepare yourself, your footwork, and how you prepare yourself was quite good. And even before you strike the ball, your back swing was pretty good. But what happened? After you do your back swing and you contact the ball with your racket, you did not what? Follow through. <laughs> and he told me that you are doing a chicken wing. <laughs> so how many of you experienced that inability to follow through in your tennis game? It's not easy, isn't it? It's not easy. Well, there are various components that we need to know in playing tennis. The grips, the backswing, if everything is good except if you do not follow through, you will not be able to be an effective tennis player. After the contact is made by the racket with the ball, the backswing is irrelevant. It's no more important. But what important is after the racket hit the ball, what happened after is more important if you follow through or not. Follow through is not only important to have a successful sports, but also in our Christian experience. We all have varieties of experience and testimonies to tell how we met Jesus in our life. We used to tell our friends we were overwhelmed by how God has changed our life. Brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that those testimonies are unimportant, but following through your commitment is more important than keep telling your old stories. It is not enough to be the hearer of the word, but the doer of the word. I'm saying this sermon not only for you, but this is also for myself. We are sometimes bragging about the truth we hold as a Seventh-day Adventist, but we are slow in applying and becoming the doer of the Word. We should not just be the hearer, but we should perform it. As James said, not just be the hearer of the Word, but a doer of the word. I received a call from one of the pastors, my friend, while I was preparing this sermon. He said that he had done so many fasting and prayer. I have seen him in my own eyes. We had a camp meeting last year. In fact, it was this year, summer, together. And I've seen him praying. He can pray almost the whole night. And, but what he said was, praying is important. Fasting is important. He had conducted so many uh, camp, camping among, among the youth, and in fact, he just came back from overseas conducting several camps. He said, practicing in our life, our daily life is more important. We can be overwhelmed 
by the things that we heard in the church from the speaker. We come to the church or we went to the men's retreat or women's retreat or camp meeting. And this year, we had a successful evangelistic meeting conducted by a group of volunteers, you and I, together. And having a young and dedicated Bible worker and preacher, Brother Ramon, and through the fruit, through that, we receive fruits by the help of God. We've seen success. My question is, to us is, does that change our daily attitude? Or we continue to live the same way. It does encourage some of us to share our faith, isn't it? Because when we see somebody coming into our, our church, when we see somebody gave their life to Jesus, when we see baptism ceremony, it does encourage us to share the Word of God, isn't it? But other than that, what about our daily conduct? If we still continue to look like the world, speak like worldly people, if there is no difference in our action, in the way we dress at home, the way we communicate with our spouses, if we do the exact same thing as the world does, in our choice, what do we do in our leisure time? Does it change anything? We still behave like the world, same attitude like the world. Others can't figure out if we are member of the group of believers who believe in the nearness of the second coming of Jesus. If they can't figure out there's something wrong within us, what is the problem? Are we not following through, dear brothers and sisters? Somebody say, follow through brothers and sisters. Follow through brothers and sisters. Can you say to your neighbor, follow through brothers and sisters? Amen. Have you heard about the word akrasia? It is some kind of not common words, right? Akrasia. In the summer, in 1830, Virgo, Victor Hugo, was facing an impossible deadline. Twelve months earlier, the French author had promised his publisher a new book. But instead of writing, he spent that year pursuing his other projects and entertaining guests and delaying his works. Frustrated Hugo, publisher, responded by setting a deadline less than six months away. The book had to be finished in February 1831, which is less than six months. Hugo is considered to be one of the greatest, best-known French writer in the 19th century. And Hugo concocted a strange plan to beat his procrastination. He collected all of his clothes and asked an assistant to lock them away in the large chest. Kind of weird, right? He was left with nothing to wear except large shawl. <laughs> lacking, any, lacking any suitable clothing to go outdoors, he remained in study and wrote furiously during the fall and winter of 1830. And then, The Hunchback of Notre Dame was published two weeks early on February 14, 1831. Human beings been, has been procrastinating for centuries. Even prolific artists like Virgo, uh, Hugo has not immune to the destruction of daily life. The problem is so timeless. In fact, the ancient Greek philosopher like Socrates and Aristotle developed a word to describe this type of behavior as akrasia. And akrasia is a state of acting against your better judgment. It is when we do something even though you know you should not do. 
and loosely translated as akrasia as procrastination or lack of control. Akrasia is what prevents you from following through on what you set out to do. Sometimes, akrasia effect is seen in our spiritual life as well. It is not only our physical life. In our physical life, we receive a call from God, right? Some receive it so clear, and we are overwhelmed, and we share that call of God to our friends and our loved ones. But we let other things choke away the spirit. Just like the parable of the sower, there is nothing wrong with the seed, isn't it? And there is nothing wrong with the sower. What was wrong there? It was the soil, isn't it? So what kind of soil we are? What kind of spirit we have today? Are you and are we a soil like a thorny grounds? Are we a soul like a stony grounds? That we immediately accept the message and grew and sprouted, but because we don't have root in it, our soil was not prepared, it was not plowed, and it withered away. Are we a soil like a good soil that bears many fruit? that follow through the Word of God that we receive and transfer the Word of God to our neighbors, to our friends, to our loved ones, that we want also them to have the mention that God had prepared for us. How to avoid procrastination to follow through your plans? First, what Hugo did was he designed a future action. Like Hugo, we need to put out all the unnecessary Distractions. What kind of distractions are in this world? What kind of distractions we have in our homes that avoid us from getting the word of God, that avoid us from growing spiritually? Number two, reduce the friction of starting. You see a very popular slogan by Nike, right? What was that? Just do it. When you see something good to do, we should not wait. We should just start off and do it. If you keep saying to yourself, maybe I'll start tomorrow, or maybe I'll start next week, it will never happen. So we have to do, just do it. I'm not saying that something that is not right, you should just do it. No, I'm not saying. If you see that, if your conscience, if you see that it's inclined with the Word of God, you just have to step out and start doing it. Utilize implementation intentions. That's number three. Sometimes we have to state, we have to verbalize it. Sometimes we have to write it down when I'm going to actually start it. <laughs> Just like sometimes we have New Year resolution, right? I am planning to do better in my health. Maybe I'll have to go to gym more often, right? But that plan and that desire is not enough unless you really start it off or you put out in action. Maybe you have to put like, I'm going to start going to gym on so-and-so date and this time so that I will follow through. That is going to help you and for, help us, even not only physical world, but also in a spiritual world as well. What motivating you and I today? The answer is the more we do, the more things we do is going to motivate us to do more of that type. Isn't it? The more we care for others, the more we pray for others, the more we study the Bible, the more we act according to our better judgment, the louder we will hear the voice of God. Amen? We, as the Seventh-day Adventists, have no problem of our knowledge or our information, but what we do with our information. Are you willing to share? Are you willing to put out in action? Somebody say, follow through. Follow through. I have seen um, 
Miss Bellini starting off a sidewalk servant. And it's very impressive. Uh, it may not be as big as what other people are doing, but it reminds me of uh, uh, one of the couple that I really admire, Keith and Melody Green. Have you heard about their story? They were uh, in, uh, in 1970s, um, and they were stepping out. Keith Green was actually start off with singing a secular song, but after he received, after he received the love of Jesus, he can no longer sing a secular song, and he composed so many good songs, and he sang hard, hard, uh, hard, wholeheartedly. And <clears throat> they even developed a ministry that they collected people that are sitting and standing and, you know, on the sidewalk, those who don't have a place to stay, those who are poor, those who are drug addicts, they collect those people and call them in their homes and give them Bible studies. But unfortunately, um, Keith Green died very early in his 30s by plane accident. I was inspired by their stories. It reminds me of your, your, your work that you do, but of course, with the help of God, God bless you and it will increase. Um, in John chapter 10, verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In order to hear God's voice, sometimes we need to put away all the things that we fit in in our minds, like internet, like TV, the, the favorite channel that comes in 6.30 on Monday nights, <laughs> or our news, watching of news is important, it's, it's good, right? But sometimes it can distract our connection with God. And cell phones, sports and entertainments, Facebooks, even our, the so-called good things like our work, it can fall between us and God. Anything that we put higher than God is something that we need to put it away. What about our Sabbath afternoon? How do we spend our Sabbath afternoon? Of course, God meant this Sabbath day for rest, isn't it? And we are supposed to rest. And after sleeping eight or nine hours on Friday evening, right? We come to the church after potluck, eating all what we can, going back. <laughs> Sleep until we see the sunset, right? <laughs> Sometimes sleeping too much, even Proverbs, it says, it doesn't cause any good to us, right? Sometimes it's helpful after maybe taking rest for one or two hours. Let's find a way to help people that are in need and form a group that study the Bible and talk about Jesus and heaven so that we can be longing for the mention that God had prepared for us. One day, Jesus and his disciples were having a long journey. They were going to watch uh, the Samaria uh, cities from Galilee. And as they are reaching one of the Samaritans' uh, city called Sychar, he met a woman by the well. And he sent his disciples in the city to buy some food. And as he was having conversation with the woman, we know the story, right? What was the outcome? And the disciples came back and asked their teacher, Jesus, Lord, are you not hungry? And it, what Jesus had responded this way. In John chapter 4, verse 34, it says, My food, Jesus said, it is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. As we keep on doing God's work, as we open up ourselves, coming out from our comfort zone to do for, to, for the Lord, it is going to become enjoyful. It's, it, it's, it's going to become enjoying to do. And that way, it will be habituated in our life in order to hear the voice of God, sometimes you need to put space and a place. Space and a place. 
How many of you have seen the movie called War Room? Yes, we've seen that lady. She was dedicating one of her shelf to pray and meet her God because she understood that she cannot fight, fight that war by herself. She understood that she came to understand that the war belongs to God. And that's why she spent her time praying in that closet. And sometimes we need to find a place and a space to meet with our Lord. Sometimes it has to be away from our parents, away from our spouses, away from our children, just with God. And this is not something new. Even in the Bible, the Abraham did the same thing. He found battle as a meeting place with God. Hezekiah, when he saw the people of God were not following his will, he was crying by the wall. What about Daniel? Daniel kneeled by the window and facing towards Jerusalem and interceding on behalf of God's people. He was crying and asked God for forgiveness. What about Jesus, our model? He also used to go to Mount Olive in a secluded place like the Garden of Gethsemane. He used to talk to his father and ask for strength. Speaking of my father, we went to Maryland recently and we came across a program that was specially designed for my father. And the people who knew my father express their experience with him. They, used to, they mentioned that my father was a man of prayer. And when he was doing his master's away from home, in our hometown there was a camp meeting that was going on. And he said, since I cannot go there, I'm going to stay on top of the banyan tree and stay the whole night praying. Wow. I know I am not at all comparable to my father. But I learned something from him. And he's a man of prayer. When he was just 20 years old, his dad threw him out from the house because he was willing to join a group called Seventh-day Adventist. And one of his best friends found him in a cave, praying, praying whole night. He was so discouraged, but he was praying and asked God for strength. And how much time we spent in reading the Word of God today. Scripture has power. If open, it can open our hearts if we read. When we pray, sometimes we don't let God to work. We ask God, I need it now, right now. <laughs> God, please give me now. We don't think far that what will happen if He give that particular thing to us at that time and how it's going to affect others, we don't realize. Satisfy now mentality is now very common in our generation. If you look at the TV advertisement, what happened? Call it now, right now, before it, somebody gets it away. Call it now. 1-800-665-8492. Don't call that number. It's not going to work. <laughs> I just made up that number. But we are living in a time that call now, right now, you have to get it now. I want to play a video today that is called Delayed Gratification. And it is a <clears throat> show that was from Dr. Phil and Lonnie. They had an experiment with some children, three to four year old, and they gave a marshmallow. And they told these children, if you can wait until we come back, you will get the next marshmallow and see how many kids can wait. According to the research, they track these kids down until they are adult. Those who wait for 15 minutes can score 210 points higher in their SAT exams. Those who wait for 15 minutes are more successful in life. And those who cannot wait are involving more into drugs addiction, more health problems, problems in maintaining health relationship with others, less confident, 
less decisive, more financial difficulties, higher percentage in keeping the law. As we wait for the Lord's return, we need to have delayed gratification. We're not going to have everything we want in this world, even if you are given an opportunity. Why not wait for the better mansion built by God, not by hands? Our Sabbath school lesson also talk about heaven, isn't it? How it's going to be, how it's going to be heaven. How we are going to dwell in heaven. How we're going to build houses. How everything is going to be complete. Why not wait for better car or transportation? Because if we wait, we'll be given a wings like an eagle, and we can fly like angels. Why not wait for a better job or salary employed by God and glorify God instead of trying to look for a job? Why? That not even help you to keep the Sabbath. Why not wait? Living like a Christian means daily renewed and rehearsed life. As you try to follow through, there are obstacles on the way. There are failures coming on the way. But we need not to give up. We need to stand firm. Never give up to do good. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, not giving up meeting together as some of are in the habits of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day is approaching. We have started off very good after our uh, evangelistic meeting with a prayer meeting during the midday, midweek, right? But it is difficult to keep on going. Brothers and sisters, starting good, kicking off is not that hard, but finishing well is something that we need to work on. It requires commitment. Kevin and Merlin Ryan, in their book, Marriage, Making a Marriage, they said number one reason for divorce is lack of commitment. The willingness of following through is there, but it's hard to continue your commitment. In Los Angeles County, they say in this book, more than 60% of new marriages end in divorce. When we got baptized, we made a vow to our God that we'll be faithful, we'll follow all the instructions, but we do have to make true commitment and follow through those vows. We are already in a stage where we are no of point of no return. One of the writers, Debar, he stayed on his article, The Point of No Return, he writes, once the distance ahead is shorter than that already traveled, a plane can no longer turn back to its starting point, however serious its mechanical duties may be. So even though there may be difficulties in the plane mechanism, the plane cannot turn back after he finishes halfway. Brothers and sisters, we have come so far. Let's finish the race. Let's fight a good... Let, let, let's, let's keep fighting and let, let's make our maker happy. God had already envisioned the end of the ark as we start swinging. But sometimes we fail to see through what's going to come at the end. But we need to hold on God. We should not be like Lot's wife, turning back and think about what we have done, what are the wrong things we have done. But we have to trust in Jesus and keep moving on. Friends, we are here. We cannot the point of no return, we cannot turn back. We cannot modify or we cannot change the things that have done in the past. But Jesus will follow us all the way as we are willing to take his hand. Following Jesus ever day by day, 
Nothing can harm me when he leads the way. Sunshine or shadow, whatever before, Jesus, my shepherd, is my all in all. God promised us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, He who began a good work in you will continue until Christ come. Christ is our friend. Jesus is our friend. We also heard what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Prayer is everything, my friends. Well began is half done. We have seen, we have heard a quote, right? But I, t- I tell you, my friend, that is the right quote. But at the same time, bad ending is a failure. Bad ending is a failure. As we are going through 2018, we almost finished the race, isn't it? Even though we may start off well at the beginning of the year, but along the line, we falter and go astray. But my friends, we still have hope. How many days left? There are two more days, right? Let's finish it well. Let's finish with hope. It's just like entering into the promised land, right? The children of Israel were afraid. They were traveling only a few weeks, and they are in the border of Canaan. And they sent spies, but 10 of them said, no, they are so big. Those people that were dwelling in those places are so big, we cannot, we cannot you know, fight them. We don't have armies, we don't have arms. But God told them through Joshua and Caleb. God had already taken their weaknesses. God has given us strength. We can fight, and He's going to stand for us. But the majority of the people do not want to go ahead and trust God. We're almost entering into the new year. It's just like opening a new page in 2019. And the page is completely white. I remember when my dad and my, <clears throat> my mom asked us to write a diary when we were young. So they will come back at the end of the day and ask us, what's your diary? And they, they let us read in front of them. And sometimes I forgot to write my diary and try to avoid the scolding from my parents. I asked my bigger brother, can I look at your diary so that I can recall some of the things that has been done maybe two or three days ago? <laughs> but you know, we are in a race. Everyone need not to be number one, fortunately. Our only goal is to finish the race. We are like running a marathon, right? In marathon, they rejoice. People rejoice not only the one who had finished the first, but everybody who is finishing the race, right? So we all have a crown waiting for us. And also, we can see one lesson from Peter. Peter and other apostles, when Jesus called them, when he called the disciples, what did they left? They left their nets, right? They left their profession. And what about at the end of the story, when Jesus was crucified on the cross and rose again? Before he rose again, they were so discouraged, right? They're expecting that their leader, their master, I would say their magicians, will be a great king. But it didn't happen that way. And they were so discouraged. And what happened to these people that are doing fishing, that are fishermen? They went back doing the same work that they left before. And what happened was, in John chapter 21, verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, John of, uh, son of John, do you love me more than this? What is more than this? More than this, those, these are the things that they left, their profession, in the name of Jesus, in the name of their master, and their fishes. But Jesus saw them that they went back 
to their old profession. Instead of proclaiming the word of God, proclaiming the miracles of God, they went back. And that's why Jesus asked him the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And the third time he asked again, and he said, Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. After we receive the goodness of God and overwhelmed by the love of Jesus, sometimes we do not follow through. We went back to the same old habits. And we need a reminder. And the reminder is just like the reminder given to Peter. Sheep my feet. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Are we taking care of God's people today? We are not here. We are not existing here just for the sake of it. We are here for a purpose. God meant each one of us here for a purpose. He wants us to maximize our ability. He gave each one of us an ability that will maximize up until we reach heaven. But sometimes, since we fail those goals that God gave for us, we went into the plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Some of us are in the plan Z right now. <laughs> it is not because God is failing, but it is because we are failing. But a good God that we have, He still make us another plan, another plan for us. But we can excel. When you see people who are excel in their works, in their preaching, in saving souls, it's just that they are trying to follow and follow through the tasks that were given to us. Brothers and sisters, it is not something that we can do, but it's that we have a God who will do it for us. As we are near to rolling into 2019, we cannot fix or undo what was done in 2018. There are things that we ought to do that we didn't do. And what we did, what we are not supposed to do, we may regret it now, which we should. Regretting, regretting is a good thing because we realize at least that what we did was wrong if it leads to reformation. But it has its time and place. Brothers and sisters, there will be a time that our regrets will have no value. But before we reach to that stage, let's regret for the things that we have not done and the things that we should have done which we didn't do and try to rearrange it. We have to rearrange sometimes our pattern, our habits. We still have to arrange our home and our house, isn't it? Even though it's going to mess again. But we still have to clean again, even though it's going to mess up again in one or two days. But it really helps us to rearrange, isn't it? So sometimes we need to rearrange our habits. We need to renew your commitment. We may think about, I do not want to make resolution anymore because I will break it in two days or I'll break it in a few weeks. But if it's a good resolution, make it. At least it helps you to renew yourself because we are a kind of being that God created, created us that we need to renew daily, isn't it? We need to renew ourselves daily. In conclusion, I want to read this uh, from my life today from page 369. Um, first, let's turn our Bible before we read that. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. It says, This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press on toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. We need to press on. We need to press on. And in my life today, uh, Mrs. White wrote here, As you enter upon a new year, let it be with an earnest resolve to have your course onward and upward. Let your life be more elevated and exalted than it has hitherto been. Make it your aim not to seek your own interest and pleasure, 
but to adv advance the cause of a Redeemer. Remain not in a position where you ever need help yourself and where others have to guard you to keep you in a narrow way. You may be strong to exert a sanctifying influence upon others. You may be where your soul's interest will be awakened to do God's to others, to comfort the sorrow, strengthen the weak, and to bear your testimony for Christ whenever opportunity offers. Aim to honor God in everything, always and everywhere. Carry your religion into everything. Prepare for eternity with such a zeal as you have not yet manifested. Educate your mind to love the Bible, to love the prayer meeting, love, uh, to love the, all, the hour of meditation, and above all, the hour when the soul communes with God becomes heavenly minded in you. God unite with the heavenly choir in the mentions above. The last things that I want to appeal to you today is never stop praying. Keep praying, keep praying, my friends. Keep praying so that the Arcasia effect may not hold us back in our spiritual life. So that we will live a transparent life so that people can see us, our thoughts and our action will incline one another. And that way, we can be shedding the light of God, like lighting in the hill. And uh, as we come close to this 2018, I want each one of us to make a commitment to God that, Lord, I will not be an Arcasia effect. Lord, I will not procrastinate the work that you have given me. Even though it may not be difficult, it may not be easy for you to do by yourself, God is going to stand with you in your commitment. May God bless you all.